Good morning, everybody. How are you? This is my obligatory time where I discover who's in the room. <laughs> and I just do small talk, banter. There you go. Great, good people of Dwarf Hope. How are you? Good to have you guys here. Happy Sunday. Um, welcome. If uh, you're a visitor here, hello. My name's Tim, and you're you, and that's awesome. Um, we... Today, uh, in terms of our, our teaching, you know, when we gather together on Sundays, which is less than one-seventh of what we do together as a church, uh, but it is a really key part of what we do. We come together to sing, which is what Jesus' people have been doing from the very first house gatherings of his disciples, singing praise to the one who loves us and gave himself for us. And uh, we meet together and with him and worship and taking the bread and the cup. Uh, but we also open the scriptures every week together to learn and grow. And this summer, we've uh, been camping out uh, in this series called The New Day. Uh, and it's, we're going to conclude it today. And it's, we're going to usher into new, exciting things uh, in the series for the fall, uh, which Josh will be, uh, uh, he's back. So the lead, again, if you're newer to Door of Hope, uh, uh, the lead pastor who started Door of Hope uh, with his core team, uh, had eight weeks off this summer that um, was a, a sabbatical, so Door of Hope turned seven this year, and um, we wanted him to have a time of rest, uh, but also a time to reflect on kind of what's, what's next for Door of Hope in the season ahead. So he's, uh, gonna, he's back in the game, and uh, he's going to be uh, teaching for the first time in a couple months uh, next week, and we're excited about the fall teaching series, and that's going to be awesome, but Mum's the word. You just will have to come and find out. So anyway, but today we're uh, closing the series we've been in this summer called A New Day. Uh, and we have been exploring what it means to live in the light of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Um, Christianity is most classically connected to the image and the icon of the cross, Jesus' death. And that's a crucial, obviously, crucial, pun intended, center point of who we are, that Jesus died for us and for our sins. But the cross doesn't mean what it means without the fact that Jesus rose from the dead after that. And in fact, all of the earliest followers of Jesus always talk about the cross and the resurrection together. And understanding what it means to live as people of the risen Jesus and what it means to embrace our own hope of the resurrection. This is like Christianity 101. Uh, but strangely never gets talked about, so, or at least not very often. So that's what we've been doing this whole summer. And today uh, it's going to come to a close. Um, the resurrection of Jesus, the empty tomb, and the events of Easter uh, were not something that the disciples of Jesus saw coming. It's not something that they anticipated. Even though Jesus hinted at it, and even more than hinted, tried to tell them that the cross, his execution, wouldn't be the end of the story. But their framework for that didn't have room for the fact of Jesus uh, coming back to life in a new kind of existence. They just had no categories for this idea. And so when it happened, it shocked all of them. And so we camped out in the stories, uh, some of the eyewitness accounts in the Gospels of the disciples encountering the risen Jesus. And it, it shattered everything they thought they knew about the world and about God, about themselves. And then as the Jesus movement began to spread around the ancient world, and the decades went by, the apostles, whose writings we have in the New Testament, they reflected on how significant the events of Easter were for what it means to, to follow Jesus, that if Jesus became what we are so that we could become what he is, that what it means is that what happened to Jesus is the hope of what will happen to me as one of his disciples, that death won't be the end for you or for me as his, as his followers. And so we've explored that whole idea uh, in the New Testament. And then even one other step. Uh, the apostles were convinced that what, what happened on Easter, that the Jesus that walked out of the empty tomb alive from the dead in a new kind of existence. It was physical, but a new kind of existence. They were convinced this wasn't just about humans, but the, the future of the universe, as I've said, walked out of the tomb on Easter Sunday. 
And so we've sat with this idea in a couple of teachings, but today it's fitting that we should turn to the second to last page of the Bible uh, to allow the empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus to truly expand out into um, the, the glorious Christian hope of a universe raised from the dead, of a resurrected world. And that's exactly what, uh, what John's talking about here. Um, so uh, I'll put, just put it, the big passage up here on the screen, but uh, as most of you have it open in front of you or turned on in front of you, whichever. And uh, this, is, this is a glorious, glorious uh, passage of Scripture. Uh, it comes right near the end of the story, and it's this uh, vision from the Revelation. So let's just stop right there. Um, this is uh, the, from the book of the Revelation, not Revelations, with an S on the end. It's the most common mispronunciation of the book, uh, the Revelation. And, um, you know, I was a little nervous in picking a passage to teach on in this series from uh, the Revelation, because here's what I found about this book in modern, modern audiences, at least in the West. Um, much like, uh, as I often say, cilantro divides a room in half. <laughs> half love, <laughs> half hate, half are repulsed by it. Um, the book of Revelation has much of the same effect on modern readers. Um, either some people love it and are obsessed with it, and often, not always, but often it's connected to an upbringing or a background in church traditions that are really into prophecy timelines and end times, timetables and this kind of thing, uh, when predicting Jesus' return and all that. So some people love it and find it endlessly fascinating for that. And it's precisely that group of people that makes the other half of the room totally weirded out and repulsed by the book of Revelation. And they're just like, I just want to love and follow Jesus. I don't know. It'll all pan out in the end kind of thing. So that's about the effect that this book has on, on modern readers. And it's, it's understandable. Um, it seems like a bizarre book to most modern readers. And eventually, you know, you might get accustomed to it. But it's, it's a highly image driven book, full of imagery that it's just fantastic and out outstanding, and, and the author, John, has all of these visions that he's writing down. It seems bizarre to modern readers. It was not bizarre uh, <clears throat> to the first followers of Jesus, who were all Jewish. <clears throat> um, the book of Revelation is a perfect example of a kind of literature that was very popular uh, at the time of, of Jesus. Um, called the period of the sec Second Temple or Second Temple Judaism. Uh, Bible nerds today call it Jewish apocalyptic literature. Uh, but the book of Revelation is not the only book of its kind from this time period. Uh, there are many other Jewish apocalypses um, that recounted dreams or visions that prophets had. And what these dreams or visions do is they give the prophet or the visionary a chance to zoom up to like 30,000 feet, so to speak, over history and current events and to, to offer God's point of view on the meaning of history and the meaning of events and what's gone wrong and where it's all going. And the primary way that all of these, uh, Book of Revelation, but other Jewish apocalyptic texts, I could give you a whole list of them. You can go buy translations of them down at Powell's and you will be better off for it because they're fascinating to read. Uh, but the way that all of these texts uh, communicate is through Im heavy, intense imagery. Uh, the, the best uh, analogy that I can find, it's not perfect, but it's a good one. Uh, in our own way of thinking about media and communication today uh, is, is cartoons, and specifically uh, political cartoons. So work with me here. You guys ready? Just work with me here. You'll see two appear on the screen. Um, one, each one of them is lampooning the main uh, presidential candidate. Got to play fair, right? Since uh, this is a diverse crowd at Door of Hope. So there you go. So there you go. Hillary is getting made fun of, and so is Donald right there. So let's play fair. Okay, so here's two uh, recent political cartoons. Now, if you're an American citizen, if you uh, have... Even just if you're not an American citizen, if you've been in American culture for, say, five years, do you need me to explain these cartoons to you? Do you get it? You get it, don't you? 
The one on the upper left is brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> Come now, all right? Whether or not you agree with it, let's just give, this is a very creative, thoughtful artist, you know what I'm saying, in a million ways. And the one on the lower right, if you're an indie race car fan, this is also brilliant in its, in its own right, right? Do you need me to explain this to you? I, I, don't, I don't think you do. Um, so, but just think, if, let's say someone from Jesus' day, you know, a Jewish person who's living in ancient Rome were to time travel, right, and come sit next to you right now and be looking at these images, would it make perfect sense to them? No, of course not. Where do you, what do you think they would start asking about? Why is there a man in a dark, like, costume wearing a cape? What's that blonde bangs protruding from there? And why is there an elephant hanging from a spaceship weather vane, right, in the cloud city of Bespin? Is no one, like, what's happening here? <laughs> like, what's that about, right? Um, and why is there, what, what's that automobile, and why is it crashed before the finish line and Indy race cars, and why is there a donkey pushing it? Like, what's, are you with me? These are not self-explanatory. You actually have to have a very sophisticated knowledge of American history, of American political symbolism and imagery. You also have to have a background in American sports, race car sports. You have to be well-versed in a whole imaginary universe right? <laughs> known as Star Wars. And do, do I have to teach you any of these? No, you're just, you, you, you get it, you get it. So it, these are images and symbols that refer to real people and real things in history, but also laid on top of them as a layer of symbols and images from other real things or imaginary worlds, and it all swirls together into these really complex drawings that didn't require you to have an explanation. Um, but an ancient reader would. And I would suggest to you that when we come to the book of Revelation, it's, it's exactly the same thing, just the citrus walk. You and I have become time travelers to ancient Israel-Palestine. And we are being invited into the highly image-driven uh, dreams and visions of John that he, you know, like your dreams are weird and fantastic, by the way, uh, but also that John clearly had these experiences and then he prayerfully meditated over them and represented them in this form of literature. Uh, that was common in, in John's day. And just like uh, these assume that you have a knowledge in IndyCar racing and Star Wars, John's uh, apocalypse assumes that you are immersed in the world of the Hebrew Scriptures and in the world of first century Roman Israeli politics. <laughs> that's what John assumes that you know, and that's why we find it all so bizarre. And so, like, lesson number one, I'm, we're going to move on real quick here, but just lesson number one, and this is for free. Um, the book of Revelation seems weird to you primarily because we don't live in his time and place from 2,000 years ago. That's why it repulses half the room and fascinates the other half of the room. And so the, what we always have to do is first ask, first humble ourselves, and then second, ask, what is the thing that he's alluding to and what thing is he picking up from the Old Testament scriptures or from his culture and adapting and doing something brilliant with to, um, to communicate? And the way that John has pulled from the Old Testament and then mixed it together with his vision of the empty tomb and the resurrection and what that means to, for following him and the future of the universe, brilliant. Think of brilliance. Dude, the book of Revelation is what I'm telling you. It's um, a work of literary ninja re. <laughs> it's really am amazing and, and brilliant. Let me just show you one example, and it's from the paragraph. Let's go back to the paragraph here. Oh, let's go back. Um, so uh, first line, and this will get us right into the, the resurrection and, and how the book of Revelation works. So when you heard or, or read the first lines of this uh, great paragraph right here from Revelation 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth passed away. There was no longer any sea. Now, even if you're not an expert in the Old Testament scriptures, my hunch is that some page of the Old Testament came into your mind. And which page would you be? There was a spoiler alert. We kind of went with the screen already. What page? What page of the Old Testament? Page one. Page one. He's deliberately 
echoing the opening words of the, of the whole Bible from Genesis chapter 1. Now just pay attention. A new heavens and a new earth. First heaven and the first earth passed away. And what's no more? The sea. Now Christian surfers around the world are very depressed when they read this line, right? They're like, really? I was actually hoping I could do quite a lot of that in the new creation. But and I, you'll see, I actually do think there's, there's still hope once you get the meaning of John's image. Okay, so let's go back to where he's, he's quoting from, and you'll, you'll see uh, what he's doing here. So he's, he's quoting from the opening lines of the Bible. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. Um, when you see the heavens... Don't think city in the sky. Uh, the heavens is the normal Hebrew way of referring to the clouds, like what's up there, the sky. Um, and when you see the earth, don't think globe, right? Hebrews had no concept of the globe because um, it wasn't but six, It wasn't until like 70 years ago that you and I had a picture of the globe to look at, for goodness sakes. There's no way that's what was in their head. What's in their head is what, if, if heavens refers to what's up there, what does earth refer to? It's just what's down here. It's just like it's a normal language based on normal observations that you and I would make just standing right here, the heavens and the earth. Now, let's talk about what's down here. Um, what is the current state, the uncreated state of things in the beginning that God is working with? How are things down here on the land? Happy face, sad face. Well, it, it's wild and waste, and darkness is over the surface of the deep. And the deep there refers to the deep, deep waters of the deep seas. So, so right here, we're introduced into a very, very Israelite, ancient Israelite view of the world. Um, Genesis 1 tells a story of how God takes a chaotic watery wasteland and transforms it into a garden that's ordered, and he'll appoint the humans to both cultivate it and expand it. So the Genesis 1 is telling a story about God transforming darkness and wasteland into beauty and into order. And precisely what God does in Genesis 1 is take the sea, the chaotic sea, and transform it into land and, and garden and so on. And you might ask, like, well, okay, so why, why is, this, is the sea this image of, of chaos? You know, so we take cruise ships out into the oceans and whatever. We certainly haven't tamed the thing. Did you guys know there was a new species of whale discovered just three weeks ago? Did you see this? It was a, de it was a dead, they call it a beak-nosed whale. Um, that wa it washed up. Uh, dead way up on the uh, in the Arctic, but it was a completely unknown species of whale. And you're just like, what do we know, really? We don't know anything at all about what's swimming under one. They're so amazing, right? So we, but we have a sense, sense you know, sea travel has continues to be perfected and so on. Like the sea isn't the first thing that comes to our mind when we think of the most dangerous threat to human stability and existence on planet Earth. Right? The sea is not what comes to our mind, but it is uh, what came to uh, Israelite authors' minds. If you read through the Old Testament and just tally all of the times the ocean or the sea is talked about, it is almost never positive. It, is one of the, it was one of the most threatening. The Israelites were never a seafaring people. They left that to the Phoenicians up north and the Egyptians down south. They never uh, had huge fleets except under one king's rain, but they, they were never known for being a seafaring people, and it's reflected in the Old Testament. The sea was a terrifying place to Israelites, right? And maybe it had something to do with the passage through the Red Sea, and it just freaked them all out after the Exodus, and they never wanted to make boats again after that. But so here's the point. You read through the Old Testament, the sea was a place that represented the instability and chaos of the world. It's a place where humans shouldn't spend too much time, because it will destroy you. And so, and so gent the first opening page of the Bible de depicts the uncreated, chaotic, instable state of the world as a watery wasteland. And what God does is he overcomes the sea 
to create land and garden and everything in Genesis chapter 1. Now, you can debate about the details and all, all, that, all that kind of stuff, but that is just the basic storyline of Genesis chapter 1. How are you guys doing? So John knows this. He grew up on these scriptures. And so when he envisions the, the new world that opened up on Easter morning and the kind of world that God is going to make that could be called new, a, a place that's permeated with God's love and God's presence, what does he, where does his mind go? It goes to page one of the Bible. And so what, let's go back to Revelation here. I think the next slide, yeah. So when he envisions a new heaven and a new earth, the, the way of life, the way that humans exist on the world is still marked by the same instability and chaos and, and death. And so what God is going to do is invite the world, because of the resurrection of Jesus, into a new kind of existence, a new kind of community. And this is a world that has no sea. Do you get it? Do you get it? Good. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, and so what we want to know is, okay, but what does that actually refer to? in terms of like the physical makeup of this, re this, this resurrected universe? Does it actually mean there's no H2O molecules gathered together in large bodies, right? And yeah, like that's what our minds go. And that's a similar question to asking of these political cartoons. Okay, so, so is a donkey actually going to push Hillary at some point in this election? Like, will a donkey appear on the stage? And the artist would just be like, no, you, no, no, you don't get it. That's not the meaning of the image. Are you with me? I think we're missing the point when we, when we ask if there's going to be H2O molecules in the new creation. We're just missing, we're missing the point. The point is we, we get the echo of page one of the Bible. And what we see is this is the world where every threat to, to the safety and stability of the new creation has been removed. If John were sitting and right, having his visions in the 21st century, he, he would say, you know, a new heaven, a new earth, and there were no longer any nuclear weapons or something like that. It's thinking of the ultimate threat to human safety in existence. How are you guys doing? Okay, so just put on this set of glasses and read through the whole book of Revelation, and it will blow your mind. It's the most brilliant, most brilliant uh, theological literary work. It's incredible. Now, I want to focus in here um, on something, now that we're equipped with a, a set of reading skills, um, look at what he does here when he opens his vision of the new creation. He calls it the new heaven and the new earth. And the first heaven and the first earth passed away. So if you, if you just read that at face value, what it seems to say is, which uh, heaven and earth are you and I inhabiting? The old one. It's going to pass away. And God's going to bring about a new one. So that puts in our minds a, a story. So we live in uh, the present heaven and earth that you and I are, are familiar with, and God's going to bring about a new one. This one's going away. What that's tended to feed into um, is a, a story that's very common in many traditions of Christianity uh, about this world being second-rate um, or evil primarily because it's physical and material. And what God is going to do is bring about a new world of some kind that's well, partly physical or not physical at all. Mo most of us haven't really worked that one out. And the goal, though, is to get out of this heaven and earth and get into heaven or a new heaven and earth. And I, just from reading this paragraph itself, I just would like to invite us to see that what John's saying is actually more complex, it's more sophisticated than that. If you don't think, as a, as a follower of Jesus, that your ultimate eternal destiny is in a non-physical world of clouds and bliss and so on, even if that's what you don't believe, your neighbors who aren't followers of Jesus definitely think that's what you believe. And they think that your ultimate dream and vision is to get out of the world, as opposed to engage it and, and live in it and seek its well-being. And so what this, is, this matters, because... What, what a person hopes for shapes what they live for. 
And so if the story is to like scrap this heaven and earth and let's just wait for the new one, if that's my primary way of thinking about it, it will affect how I live and engage this heaven and earth. And John's inviting us to, to see something that's more interesting than that, I think. Because look at the last line when he uses the word new again. If we just had that first sentence, we would definitely have the, this one completely gone and it'll be brand spanking new one. But look at what he says here at the end. The one who is seated on the throne says, I am making all things new. I am making all things new. Now, both in the language John's writing in, in Greek, and in English, just take two words, new things, and swap their order. And what you get is a sentence that says, I am making all new things. But is that what it says? It doesn't say I'm going to make all new things. It's going to, I'm making all things new. Now, is there a difference in your mind between those two? There is. There is in English and there is in Greek. To make all new things says the things that existed before, done, never, over. New things. But what John actually says is there are things that are right now and they are going to be made new. So which is it? Is the first sentence saying I'm going to make all new things? Or is it the last sentence I'm going to make all things new? Which is it? It's exactly right. <laughs> what, what, what this, the fact that we're asking the question shows that, that we have the wrong categories. We don't have the right categories. We have this idea that if something is going to be done away with, that it has no connection to the new thing it will become. And if something is new, it means it's completely disconnected from the old. And John will say, oh, no, sorry, I'm sorry. Language is failing me at the moment, the empty tomb, <laughs> the empty tomb. John's not peering into a crystal ball here. He was a witness to the risen Jesus. And where his mind goes is to say, if, if what happened on Easter is the future of the universe and the future for Jesus' followers, how do we begin to talk about that resurrected world? And he does it with the word new. Now, we've already nerded out, but can we nerd out on one more thing? And then we'll, <laughs> then we'll move on. And this is really, this is really fascinating, because um, it's a, a challenge that we have in English. I think one, one of, is one of the main challenges here. Uh, and it's with the word new. Um, there, are, in the language John's writing in, in Greek, and all through the New Testament, um, Greek, or the Jewish Greek that the New Testament was written in, has two different words for new. In English, we just have one. New. <laughs> in, in, in John's language and in the language of the New Testament authors, they have two, and they have different nuances of meaning, and it's important to actually see the difference. So the, the first one, it's less common, and you can see it up there at the top, it's called neos, neos. And what English part of a word do we get from this one? This one went right into English through Latin, neo. It's not just a character in the Matrix although that's true, uh, right? But we put neo on, on like the front of words. Uh, make, make up your own example, but neo. So, so neos in New Testament Greek is primarily referring to the time of something, how long something's been in existence. It, it's newness of time. Uh, neos is one of the main words. You actually don't see it very often translated as new, because the most often way it's used is of young people. It gets translated as a young person or a new, a new person, <laughs> meaning a young person, one who has not lived very, very long. So it's new in time. But then there's another word. It's more common in Jesus' teachings, in Paul, and I'll let you guess which word that John is using in, in Revelation, that doesn't have to do with how long something's existed. It has to do with its quality or its nature. This is a little a parable that Jesus told where he uses both words and he plays them off each other. It's brilliant. Um, where he talks about no one pouring new neos wine into old wineskins. 
Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wine skins will be ruined. Okay, so let's pause real quick here. They didn't have Ziploc bags, and they didn't have plastic containers. Or, um, so when, for most humans, for most of human history, when they want to make something that's waterproof and airtight, what, what material do they have to use? Animal materials, <laughs> either intestines, tie them up like sausage, that kind of thing, uh, or, or leather. Um, and so when he says skins here, he's referring to leather, leather pouches that would be sewn together so tight that it would be watertight and airtight. And so this is how they would ferment uh, wine. So they would get neos wine, right? So new um, grapes. Uh, but they, to become wine, not just grape juice, they need to ferment it. So they would create and sew together these leather pouches and pour the wine in and, and seal it up. And when they seal it, what does wine do over the year that is fermenting? What's it emitting through the process? Right? So gas. So what's going to happen to that bag, that leather pouch? It's going gonna, it's gonna to expand. And so they're made out of leather. So there's a limited number of times that you can do this with a leather pouch because by the sixth or eighth round, this, the leather's going to, at first it was robust and stretchy and th thick, and after another time it's going to be stretched and thin, and then it starts to dry. This is why if you have a, a leather jacket from 100 years ago or whatever, it's all brittle and you don't, it flakes and stuff like that. So it gets dry. So do you get, do you get Jesus' point here? If you want, if, if you want to ferment neos wine, you can't use old dry, thin, brittle, stretched out wineskins. What you need is a kainos wineskin. So, so this isn't about how long the wineskin has existed. It's about the quality of the leather. It needs to be a leather that's still thick and stretchy and that has a waterproof seam. It's about the quality. And it doesn't, did the goat live? Ten years or one year before we're going to, you know, kill it and then use the skin. Oh, that doesn't matter how long it's been in existence. What matters is the quality. Do you see the difference? Do you get it? Jesus is clever. Let's just say Jesus is clever, playing the two new words off of each other here. This is very brilliant. Okay, so let's go back. Let's go back to Revelation and just ask, ask yourself, which, which word do you think he's using? He's using kainos, a new quality. Look, I'm bringing about a, a new kind of creation, a new quality of existence. And the old kind of existence is going to pass away. And when God brings and invites the world into its new quality of existence, he will be making all things new. He's both... He's making new things, but more importantly, he's making all things new. Do you get it? So, so what's this talking about? This isn't just talking about material and physical existence. When, when, when John talks about the old heaven and earth, and again, you, you have to read chapters 1 to 20, right? So his vision of the world as you and I know it, it's a, it's a world that is good, that that we, who as humans, as God's images, who have been given responsibility over it, we've ruined what God has made good. We've ruined it through our own moral corruption and our selfishness, and that happens on an individual level, it happens on a corporate level. You and I inhabit a, a, a heaven and earth and a way of existing where life is a zero-sum game. It's true in nature, if the wolf wants to live, the rabbit must die. That's just how like food chains work. It's woven into the very pattern of the heavens and earth you and I inhabit. And it's true in human existence too. For this people group to have resources, this people group usually loses out on its resources. For this group to have freedom and existence and to live, some other group eventually has to die as they fight over those resources. And for me to win, you have to lose. This is the heavens and earth that you and I inhabit. Do I need to provide examples? Just think of your day yesterday. <laughs> think of your workplace and how people compete and one-up each other. And how, 
And think, think of what's happening in politics. Think of those political cartoons, right? Think of what's happening in Syria or in Iraq. Think of what, name any human community on the planet. Life is a zero-sum game. For me to win and to survive and to have abundance, usually someone else loses and goes without and dies. And, and that's heaven and earth that you and I know. And then into this heaven and earth comes Jesus of Nazareth, and he has this announcement that, that God's reign and rule and kingdom has invaded and broken into this, have the kingdom of heaven has come to invade the, the kingdom of earth. And as Jesus summons people to a new kind of life, a new way of living, how did he do it? And he boiled it down for us very clearly in key, key moments. He said, the meaning of existence is, is love. It's to live as God's images and humans under the reign of God and to love God, which is about devotion and allegiance and gratefulness and not giving my allegiance and not assigning the meaning of my life to something that's created and not the creator, to love God. And it's also about loving neighbor. They're totally connected. That I seek the well-being of others, even if it costs me, and regardless of, of their response to me. And then Jesus, he both taught about it in this thing we call the Sermon on the Mount and all of his teachings. And then he didn't just like teach about it. He lived it. He was the leader who was the servant. And he was the glorious, exalted one who gave himself to, to serve other people. And Jesus' vision of, of the universe and of what God's inviting the world into is that it's in a universe governed by God's love, life is not a zero-sum game. If I spend myself in love for your benefit, it looks like I lose, but actually I win because you win. And you got to win in a way that didn't involve you having to crush me. And then you come down and you say, like, oh, wow, you helped me like, have benefit. Can I, can I please return the favor? Because you didn't beat me up to take it from me. Are you with me? In, in Jesus' vision of the kingdom of God, life is not a zero-sum game. And, and that, there you go. That's Jesus. And it's not just his teachings. It's not just the way that he lived. It's what the meaning of his death is. The meaning of the cross is, the, is, is of God becoming human to take into himself the horror and the consequences of the sin and the evil and the treachery and the hypocrisy and the selfishness of the current heaven and earth that you and I have all produced here. And he allows it to destroy him. He allows us to win and allows himself to lose precisely for his upside-down kingdom to... And so the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the triumph of God's justice and wrath and judgment on our current heaven and earth and the way of life that we exist in. But it's also the moment of his greatest love and life because he invites us into a new kind of existence. What John saw happen at Easter isn't just about material existence, like getting reconfigured in the future. It's, it's about the meaning of life. It's about a new way of existing that the resurrection opened up. How you guys doing? Crickets. Crickets, all right. So let me, uh, let me flow this into one idea, and, and we'll, we'll kind of land this and prepare ourselves to take the bread and the cup. Just like John talks about the first heaven and the first earth passing away, and a new quality of existence, a new kind of universe and life that God has in store. And he's in the process of making all things new. In Revelation, this is all like at the future, at the end, you know, this is where history is going. But notice, in this whole series, this is the same exact language that the other apostles used to describe what's happening inside of you and me as followers of Jesus right now. Right now. Because of what Jesus did in his life and death and resurrection, because of his commitment to us in the presence of his spirit, he's committed 
to making his people new. Let me just show you two brief places. This is worth a whole series in and of itself, but just two statements from close together in Paul's writings. Paul the Apostle says, Therefore we, followers of Jesus, we don't lose heart, even though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. We are being made new. Can you guess what, what word he's using? Neos or kainos? It's kainos. So a follower of Jesus is somebody with a foot in, in two worlds, in the old heaven and earth and in the new heaven and earth. And we, we like you straddle them. And so my, my outward, right, my, my physical existence, but also like when I'm insane and forget my true identity as a follower of Jesus, the way my brain and body and mind works and the stupid decisions that I make, like that's all wasting away. And that should be very clear um, from, the, you know, the way my skin's wrinkling up and the more gray hair that I have and the way that it's painful even to just to sleep these days, you know, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, you wake up sore. How sleeping painful. But it is, right? You just, your body, you feel it. You're wasting away. But that's not the end of the story. Because of Jesus, and especially his resurrection from the dead, there is a new quality of existence that's happening right now that you're being invited into as Jesus' disciple which is what connects to one of his, Paul's most famous statements in chapter 5. He says, so then if anyone is in Christ, if anyone has given their devotion and their faith and, and wrapped their arms around Jesus for dear life, so that what becomes true of him is what becomes true of me, my identity is in Christ and what he's done for me. If that's my reality and my identity, new creation New creation. The old has passed away, and the new has come. It's exactly what John said. The old heaven and earth passed away, and the kainos has come. Now, I don't know how you feel about your body or your life right now, um, but Paul wants you to envision that your, your old humanity has passed away. Um... And if you're sitting here in the body of your old humanity, you're wondering, really? When did that happen when I was sleeping? When did that, you know, really? So what, what does that mean? It's, it's this image of having a foot in, in two worlds. So outwardly, I'm in my old heaven and earth, <laughs> my old humanity. And it's passing away quite visibly, right? As for all of us. But there's something happening inside of us that Jesus, if you allow Jesus to mess with you, and his teachings, and his presence, and his life, and his death, and resurrection, to really mess with you. What you'll find in yourself, being birthed in yourself, is a new way of, of existing. It's the way of the kingdom. It's the way of Jesus' upside-down kingdom. And there are moments, I wish they were way more often, and you probably do too, where I actually, by, by God's grace, actually obey Jesus, and follow him, and love my neighbor as myself. And when I, how many of you know what I'm talking about? And when you do that, you realize like, oh, oh, th this is real. Like, this is what I'm here for. And this is what a real human existence is all about. I don't have to win and you don't have to lose for us to weaken, to like reconcile and, and forgive each other of what we've done to each other. And we can actually find a new way forward in this broken relationship, or I can find a new way of existing in the world so that other people don't have to lose so that I win. And when you actually obey Jesus and do that, that's what Paul's saying. You're in touch with the new. The new has come. You're actually experiencing new creation, the new heaven and earth, right, here in the midst of the old one. How are you guys doing? So I, I know this is all very... In, intense imagery, and I can be very theoretical and, and ethereal, and this, this is the last thing that John, the visionary, <laughs> wants, us to, wants us to feel. John's inviting us to, to see that you and I live in, simultaneously, the old heaven and earth 
and in the new heaven and earth. And that every day I'm invited to, to choose which heaven and earth I'm going to inhabit and make decisions by and allow to be the filter for how I treat you and how we relate to each other and we live here in the city. And it's a decision that requires an immense amount of faith to allow myself to undergo loss and inconvenience so that I can serve and love other people for their own benefit. Like this, it's not natural. It's not, it can become second nature by God's grace, but it takes a long time. <laughs> it takes practice. It takes a whole community of faith, people committed to each other to living this new quality of ex existence. And so I don't, know, I don't know what that is for you. As we come to sing and to take the bread and the cup, here's the, the question that I would encourage you to ask. <clears throat> what, uh, what relationship in your life, what person, like get a person, is there a person in your life where how you relate to them, it's the old way, right? It's the broken way. And what would it look like for that strained relationship to truly be made new, the way John talks about it? What would it be for the way you approach uh, a, a difficult situation in, in your workplace or in your family? What's the new way of doing things, not the old way? It might be your own mindset as your own body ages or as life goes on and difficult things happen and, and we're disappointed and we lose opportunities and we make stupid decisions and, and we get in this, this mindset of melancholy and depression. What does it mean to truly live in the hope of all things being made new, even though in the present I'm losing out? I don't know what that is for you, uh, but Jesus knows, and he wants to meet you exactly in that place and help you see how he's making all things new within us and, and around us. Amen? Let me close in a word of prayer.